So I recently did a video talking about why online it sometimes feels as if it's autistic people versus parents of autistic children, which is sad and I wish it wasn't that way. But within that video, I responded to some comments made by Christine, who is the mother of one of the cast members on Love on the Spectrum, Abby. A lot of people within the autistic community were quite hurt by what she said. Basically, it sounded like she's unhappy with lower support needs autistic people being labeled as autistic. She wants the autism label to be left to those she considers to be truly disabled, I suppose. But after posting that, I worried that my response was a little bit harsh. I was kind of thinking about, well, how would I be if I was, you know, under the spotlight on Jubilee? And obviously it's, you know, an edited video. But then last week I saw that she had posted this video on TikTok and she's basically doubled down on what she said in the Jubilee video and maybe even gone a bit further. So her views on the subject are now very clear. Before I look at the TikTok and we respond to it, I just want to say that this is not meant to be some sort of hate video aimed at Christine, Abby's mom. I don't want anyone to like go after her or anything like that. I'm sure nobody who watches my channel would do that. But this video isn't really about Abby's mom. It's not really targeted at her. I think she's voicing opinions that a lot of people hold to varying extents. Some people do have this idea that lower support needs autistic people shouldn't be taking up space on the spectrum basically and that we're taking something from other autistic people by doing so. So she made this TikTok in response to a comment that said, wondering your opinion on why there are so many kids with autism versus years ago or am I way off? Love y'all by the way. Okay, that's a big question. Why do I think that there's more people being diagnosed than years ago in the autism world? And this is just my opinion after two decades kind of watching what's been happening. Before we go any further, I just wanna say I don't think Abby's mom, Christine, I know she works full time. I don't think she's any sort of medical professional as far as I'm aware. I think she's speaking from her experience of being a parent of just one autistic child as far as I'm aware. And I suppose she's been involved in autism communities with probably other parents of autistic children for the last 20 years. Abby is neurodeficit and a lot of people getting diagnosed today are neuro different. So in order to be diagnosed, you have to be perceived as having a deficit. Everyone who is diagnosed today, if the DSM-5 was used and the ICD-11 is very similar, everyone will have ticked the boxes for persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction. The extent to which they struggle may vary because it is a spectrum. The technical name is currently autism spectrum disorder for a reason. And this is why people are often assigned a level of support needs when they are diagnosed as well, either requires support, requires substantial support, or requires very substantial support. I don't feel like the current DSM-5 implies that every autistic person is the same in any way. However, Abby's mom is correct that the number of children being diagnosed keeps increasing. In the year 2000, it was around one in 150. Now it's around one in 36 children who are diagnosed according to the CDC. And there's a lot of different reasons for why more people are being diagnosed. There's more awareness and understanding. Also, it is true that more children who don't have an intellectual disability are being diagnosed. So she might be right that more people who are considered lower support needs are being diagnosed today. Before 2000, estimates suggested up to 75% of ASD children had an intellectual disability. Recent studies report 30 to 40% of ASD children have an intellectual disability, indicating better identification of children with ASD without intellectual disability. I don't view that as a negative personally because low or lower support needs does not mean no support needs. Most people who slip through the cracks do not sail through life with no issues. A lot of undiagnosed or autistic people really struggle with their mental health. They may have eating disorders, they may be diagnosed or misdiagnosed with a personality disorder, and they may spend some time institutionalized because of it. We also know that masking or covering up your autistic traits in order to seem less autistic, and also going unsupported, having no accommodations, both of those things are linked to mental health issues and also potentially taking your own life. For autistic people. I would agree that not all autistic people are equally disabled in all areas. That is why it's a spectrum. Neurodifferent means you didn't need speech and OT. But where is the need for speech therapy? in the diagnostic criteria, it's not there. Now, would Abby's mom consider an autistic person who has a PhD and who works as a professor at Cambridge, would she consider them neurodeficit or neurodifferent? I'm guessing she would probably say they're the definition of somebody who's just neurodifferent, except from Jason Arde, who is the youngest black professor at Cambridge, didn't speak until he was 11 and didn't learn to read until he was 18. He had a lot of support and speech therapy, so I'm guessing she'd be happy to call him neurodeficit, a professor at Cambridge. Okay, this is where it kind of falls apart. Autism is weird and complicated and people present in such different ways. That's why we have the spectrum because it is incredibly difficult to pin down specific 
profiles. The DSM-5 does leave room at the end for a clinician to specify whether the diagnosis is being made what they call with or without a language impairment. Also, what about the people who would have really benefited from speech therapy, but they weren't from an affluent area? This one study showed people from affluent areas were 80% more likely to be diagnosed as autistic. Just because you didn't access something or you weren't able to access something doesn't mean that you didn't need it and it wouldn't have positively benefited your life and the outcomes, it just means you didn't get it. Neurodifferent means you didn't need speech and OT and all kinds of therapies and music therapy. You need music therapy, guys. If you haven't had music therapy, I'm sorry to say you are not autistic. <laughs> Your diagnosis has been retracted now by Christine. Not everybody wants or needs the same supports as Abby. Abby is not the definition of autism. She is an autistic person but she is one autistic person. You didn't need an aid to go to school and you didn't get pulled out of school to go to an autism school. Some autistic people do go to conventional schools. Whether they get on well there is a completely different thing, but for a lot of people, there aren't any other options. Personally, my attendance at school was terrible because I would frequently reach a breaking point and I just couldn't go in anymore. I had very frequent meltdowns when I got home from school and my mental health was at its all time lowest during my school years, absolutely. I cried several times watching that documentary about the school that's down south in England for autistic girls. Ooh, I'm gonna cry, I'm gonna cry watching this, Oh. I wish I could have accessed something like that. Yes, I got through school, you can kind of say, <laughs> without it. I dropped out when I was 17, so I don't know how successful my school experience was compared to my peers, most of whom graduated from university. You actually went to a typical school and you had no support and you were neurodifferent. Just because you managed to get through something without help because you had no other choice doesn't mean that the help wasn't necessary. Once again, as I said in the other video, I'm not trying to equate my experience to Abby or to any other autistic person. When you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person, there are absolutely autistic people who will struggle way more in school than I did. But does that mean we leave everybody else with nothing? Oh, some people have it worse than you, so you get no support. Should we apply that to every other condition? Autism is not an illness, that's not what I'm trying to say here, but imagine if we did apply that to illnesses. Oh, sorry, some people have a worse stage cancer than you, so we're not gonna, <laughs> we're not gonna give you treatment. Like, what? That would be ridiculous. That's not really a society that I particularly want to live in. You actually went to a typical school and you had no support. You went to school and you had no support and that was a real shame, actually. And thank goodness more kids are being diagnosed today so the same thing doesn't happen to them. Then maybe they can go on to get the level of education that they deserve. And you were neurodifferent. That means you have a different brain processor. Different brain processor. I think the word she's looking for here is autistic. Super autistic. We have come up with a word for it, a diagnostic label. Again, we don't need to start making up new unscientific labels. And you were neurodifferent. That means you have a different brain processor. So social communication, social language were painful and horrible, not your thing. And it probably made life horrible. Okay, so I don't really understand this. We're acknowledging here that you do think apparently lowest support needs autistic people do struggle and do need support. But then you also said you got through school and you had no support. So which one is it? You struggle, but not enough for it to be meaningful. How much does one need to struggle in order for it to be meaningful? I think it's really important to remember here, as I'm sure Abby's mom knows, there is a lot more to autism than struggling with socializing. What about difficulties with transitions? What about sensory issues? What about meltdowns? I just feel like when Christine just focuses in on the social aspects here, you can make it kind of sound like, oh, but you're just quirky, you're just a bit awkward, you know, it's not really that much of a big deal, but that isn't what autism is. So those people today are finally getting some acknowledgement and I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I think knowing is great for your self-esteem in many ways. I am personally so much nicer to myself in my head now that I know I forgive myself for things, but I didn't get my diagnosis for acknowledgement. I got my diagnosis with the hope that I may one day be able to get the accommodations to finish studying a degree to continue my education because I need it. Because being autistic is not just about socializing and I find the experience of exams extremely stressful. I had panic attacks in numerous exams and I become very obsessive with studying around exams to the point where I neglect all of my other needs and it can become extremely unhealthy. I am not just quirky and awkward. Those people today are finally getting some acknowledgement and I think that's a good thing, but I look at it as a different thing. Okay, you might look at it as a different thing and I know you're saying it's just your opinion, so fine, but your opinion is not really based on anything concrete. Medical professionals would disagree with you because you don't have a deficit, you have a difference. You are neurodifferent, 
and Abby and people like Abby and Abby's programs were neurodeficit. Another thing that I want to note here is I think a lot of people are unhappy with the way Abby's mom constantly insists that her daughter in her mid twenties is neurodeficit. Deficit is just not a very nice word, honestly. The definition of deficit is a deficiency or failing, especially in neurological or psychological function. And the word deficiency implies a lack or a shortage or a failure or shortcoming. I personally prefer the word disability. The CDC definition for disabled is a disability is any condition of the body or mind that makes it more difficult for the person with the condition to do certain activities and interact with the world around them. I understand that Abby's mom thinks Abby struggles more than other autistic people that she's observed. I don't know what Abby's diagnosis is, what her level of support needs are, or whether she has an intellectual disability, that's what you call it in the US. In the UK we call the same thing a learning disability and then learning disability means something else over there and it's really tricky for me to know what to call it in these videos, but I don't want to speculate on Abby's diagnosis at all, that's not appropriate for me to do, but I do want to point out that two thirds of autistic people do not have an intellectual disability. And lower support needs autistic people have been included under this autism umbrella since the very beginning. Again, I don't want to speculate on the level of support needs he had, but the first person to be diagnosed autistic, Donald Triplett, was a banker who had a degree in French. Does she think he was just neuro different? Where would she wanna classify him? Abby had 20 years of speech and OT and other services just to be able to talk like a neuro different person already can. Again, how well somebody can speak is not a measure of how autistic they are. I don't know where she's got this from. So I'm not denying that the ability to communicate effectively will have a big influence on somebody's outcomes in life, somebody's ability to succeed within this society, the way it is set up for sure. However, individuals on the autism spectrum who meet expected language milestones in the first three years of life have the same outcomes in adolescence and adulthood as those who are significantly delayed in early language if one compares groups at the same developmental level or IQ. So somebody's ability to speak in their early years does not necessarily influence their life outcomes. I said this already in the last video reacting to Abby's mom, but I do wonder what parents of autistic children who will probably never speak with no amount of speech therapy, no amount of music therapy, how they might feel when they see clips of Abby chatting with her mom, clips of Abby learning to swim, clips of Abby writing and singing her own music, having a romantic relationship, you know, could they not look at that and go, mm, you see, well, she's just neuro different and actually my child, their neuro deficit. What is this competitive aspect? It's really strange. So the answer is the DSM-5. I think the diagnostic manual the doctors are using needs to be updated and changed and real specific language needs to be created so that we can honor everybody and get them the help they need, but it's not the same thing. Putting everybody on the autism spectrum to me is not helpful. And this is where I think we come down to the real problem that a lot of parents of autistic children have. We heard a similar thing from Amber, who is the mother of a very high support needs autistic child. She did an interview with Book Angel recently and I reacted to that on my channel as well. I'm no, going to me. gatekeep autism where I don't yeah. think if you're yeah. awkward or if you think yeah. different or if you can't be in a social room that you have autism. Both Amber and Christine seem to be not happy that the DSM was actually updated in 2013. Putting an umbrella over all of these things really has sickened me. Like the DSM-5 changed and so now Asperger's is a part of ASD, which it should have never been. Numerous different labels, so that was autistic disorder, pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified, Asperger's syndrome and childhood disintegrative disorder. And then there was also Rett's disorder as well, but that was completely removed from the DSM-5 because they found kind of the genetic causes of that and it's no longer seen as part of the autism spectrum anymore. But the other labels, they smooshed them together to create autism spectrum disorder. However, the DSM-4, the previous edition, which came out in 1994, was actually the first edition of the DSM-5 to class autism as a spectrum disorder. So we have been considering autism a spectrum for longer than me or Abby have been alive. And if you look at research from before 2013, it is often focused on autism spectrum disorders, plural, and it will include participants from multiple different subtypes of autism. But Amber from the other video, and it seems 
seems like Abby's mom as well may potentially be wanting the Asperger's label back. I've sat at parties with Asperger kids, which I know you're not supposed to say that word, but the intelligence in an Asperger person is such a gift. Or it may be at least some other name, some other label, some other type of subgrouping so that we could separate lower support needs autistic people, people who they deem too successful, too conventionally successful to be classed as really autistic. But the thing is, Asperger's was never a different thing as Abby's mom says here. But I look at it as a different thing. It was always understood to be autism and part of the spectrum. There was a child who I went to school with all through primary school and high school who was autistic, who at the time was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. I always knew it was autism. Sometimes they would talk to the class about it. They would always refer to it as autism. It may have been referred to as mild autism or just a type of autism, but I always knew it was autism. Remember that even though Hans Asperger, he researched autism in the 1940s, he didn't coin the term Asperger's syndrome. That was only introduced in the 1990s. So the name autism has actually been around for a lot longer and used to describe people with all different levels of support needs. Sometimes you might hear people speak online as if we got rid of the Asperger's label because Hans Asperger was involved with the Nazis and their eugenics. I'm glad we moved away from that name and that history for that reason, but it wasn't really the reason it was removed from the diagnostic criteria. It's because essentially these different subtypes of autism, including autistic disorder and Asperger's and pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified, they were basically too similar and they were given to people too inconsistently as a result of that. This is from a 2011 article, so before the DSM-5 was introduced. The Asperger diagnosis is often given when according to the DSM-4 criteria, the diagnosis should be autism. A study that examined more than 300 pervasive developmental diagnoses shows that almost half of young people receiving Asperger's or pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified, it's very, very quick and easy name to say, labels in fact met DSM-4 criteria for autistic disorder. Because interestingly, in order to get the diagnosis of Asperger's disorder or Asperger's syndrome, a child couldn't have a language delay and also no delay in cognitive development and kind of like meeting milestones and things like that. But then the diagnostic criteria for autistic disorder didn't require somebody to have a language delay either, which makes it really confusing. A 2008 paper concluded, results largely did not support differences between autism and Asperger's disorder based on current diagnostic criteria. Overall, the most salient group differences were noted when samples were categorized on IQ. Drawing definitive conclusions is difficult due to the inconsistent application of diagnostic criteria. As well as this lack of consistency in the diagnosis given, they'd also been hoping in the 1990s to identify genes associated with these four different subgroups of autism. So maybe kind of find the genes for Asperger's as opposed to the genes for autistic disorder. They were unable to do so though. It became clear that finding genetic underpinnings and corresponding treatments for the five conditions specified in the DSM-4 wouldn't be possible. Experts decided it would be best to categorize autism as an all-inclusive diagnosis. I think the diagnostic manual the doctors are using needs to be updated and changed and real specific language needs to be created that specific language would need to be based on something, some real scientific evidence, and we don't have that. We don't have a clear reason for separating people at the moment. There are actually some, particularly parents of autistic children, pushing for the label profound autism to be adopted. This is something that Eileen Lam is very keen on. She is an autistic woman. She actually works for Autism Speaks. She has two autistic children, one who has lower support needs and one who requires very substantial support. Personally, I would worry about who we would decide would fit into this category and how we would decide that. I also do wonder why specifying that somebody meets the criteria for an intellectual disability and saying that they have very high support needs, they require very substantial support. I do wonder why this doesn't kind of express the same thing. What I do like about the support needs is they are not set in stone. They can fluctuate throughout somebody's lifespan. You know, people are often diagnosed as autistic in childhood. People change a lot between childhood and adulthood and you can't always predict the ways in which they will change, particularly with autistic people. Also, again, thinking about this profound autism label, would Abby meet that? Would Eileen Lam feel like Abby has profound autism? So this is what Eileen Lam has written about her son. Charlie's struggles are severe and life-threatening. Charlie has no sense of danger, which manifests in different ways, like running in front of cars. The most upsetting manifestation is called pica. Pica is an urge to eat inedible items. Several times a minute, Charlie will try to eat something, paint off the walls, wrappers, coins. Recently, a GI surgeon pulled a screw and other items out of Charlie's colon. 
not a tiny screw, a long screw. From the description there and from what you see of Abby, you know, and Love on the Spectrum and TikToks, which are only snapshots, obviously, but it seems like Charlie is very, very different to Abby. But would you say that Abby was any less autistic because of that? I think that would be unfair and unproductive and also untrue. I think Abby is autistic and Charlie is also autistic. Honestly, I don't think Abby's mom needs to worry. Maybe she just spends a lot of time on TikTok, but out there in the real world, a lot of lower support needs autistic people do find that when they talk to people and they say they're autistic, they're kind of met with, oh, well, you don't look autistic. And then usually people will start speaking about people that they know in their lives who are very high support needs. I think that is most people's impression of autism still. It seems like there would be even less recognition of lower support needs autistic people if it wasn't for having this Asperger's label in the DSM-5 for 19 years. The Asperger's disorder category in the DSM-4 did a great service in raising awareness that some people on the autism spectrum have high IQ and good language. It is time to reintegrate Asperger's syndrome with the rest of the spectrum and to demand the same level of respect and lack of stigma for individuals across the full range of the spectrum. I very much agree with that quote. I think it's a great quote. Maybe one day there will be more specific profiles of autism again, who knows? But I feel like they would have to be based on something biological. They would have to be reliable. They would have to be applied consistently. I wouldn't want specific diagnostic labels unless they felt very grounded in reality, basically. You know, not neurodifferent. Putting everybody on the autism spectrum to me is not helpful and it's gonna make everyone autistic soon and it's diluted the very meaning of the spectrum in the first place. I don't know, I hate this fear mongering of it's gonna make everybody autistic soon. It completely invalidates lower support needs autistic people when they then try and go to their employers, to their teachers and ask for support. If this narrative is being pushed that, oh, everyone's just being diagnosed with these days, do you not see how that could potentially make life a lot harder for us? I do not appreciate people speaking like this at all. The diagnostic criteria is still strict and clear you have to have what is defined as social deficits in order to be diagnosed. The traits outlined are very similar to previous iterations of the DSM. It does not suddenly say things like, actually all introverts are autistic. You know, if you've ever looked at the ground once while you're talking to people, you're now autistic. That's how these people speak sometimes. <laughs> That's not what it is. <laughs> That's not what it says. I've actually read that some professionals are a little bit concerned that the new classification will narrow the criteria for ASD, thus some patients may no longer meet the criteria for ASD, in particular cognitively able individuals and individuals diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome and pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified. I want to ask Abby's mom here, does she feel like she's autistic? Does she have any urge to go out and get an assessment? Probably not. Most people in my life are not autistic and would not even dream of going to get an assessment. If as the CDC says, one in 36 people are autistic, it's still a minority. Most people are still not autistic and do not meet the diagnostic criteria for autism. As I have mentioned many times though, way back in 1966, we used to think autism prevalence was 4.5 per 10,000 people. I wonder whether Abby would have been diagnosed back in 1966, what would have been available to her then? Would she have been getting her speech therapy and her music therapy? I am glad that things move forwards with time and that we improve as we gain more knowledge. I think Christine might need to move with the times and maybe stop being rigid as Abby would say. Because remember, out with the old, in with the new. Don't be rigid. They even have the shirts for it. But that doesn't mean that the neuro different brain doesn't need its own category, its own support, its own community, because I think it does. There you go. Now there are some autistic people in the online autistic community who do say things like, I have no support needs basically, that you can be a no support needs autistic person. I've seen this before. I do wonder if they really have no support needs or if they just have been given no support, been offered no support throughout their lives. Maybe they would have really benefited from them. Maybe it would have improved life for them. They would have had better outcomes, but they didn't have access to it. So if nobody's giving you any supports and you have to get by anyway, you might be like, well, I had no support. I must have had no support needs. It may also be a way of distancing yourself from the unfortunate stigma of disability, which will hopefully change over time. I do want to reiterate here that I don't think every autistic person is the same or that every autistic person struggles in the same way. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm not equating my struggles to Abby's in any way, but I do find parts of her experience very relatable, being very isolated as a young child, not knowing how to talk to people, walking around on your own, talking to yourself. For example, when I was a little girl, I walked around in circles talking to myself. I wanted to join the conversation, but I didn't know how. That is exactly what I did as a young child. 
I so when I started nursery at probably around four years old, I just remember walking around in circles around the playground. I don't know where, where the nursery staff were while this was going on. Like, did nobody think, is she okay? Like, I don't know. But I would just yeah walk around in circles and kind of make up stories about the people on the playground in my head instead of interacting with them. And I don't know, it's difficult. Like, I, I'm not sure how much I wanted to be interacting with people and how much I was just I, I, I liked being on my own, I think I was enjoying myself in, in my own head to some extent, but I feel like it's kind of a sad memory. There was an element of sadness to it and loneliness at the same time. I kind of wanted to be on my own, but then I also wanted to be involved, but I didn't know how, and it kind of felt a bit like, oh, everyone else is managing this and everyone else is in there and I don't know how to be in there. And at the same time, I also don't know how much I want to be in there. I personally really love the theory of monotropism to describe autism. I have a video all about it, which you can watch. I think it's a great way to understand it and to explain it to other people. It's the idea that autistic people tend to have kind of very tunnel visioned minds. We have a tendency to in every moment kind of channel our attention, our focus on fewer things, but at a higher intensity. So things like socializing are difficult for autistic people because they require splitting our focus between lots of different things at one time and that's not intuitive for us. This theory really helped me to see how autism could be both a difference and a difference that sometimes leads to amazing strengths, but also could be disabling in this world. And I do think all of those things can be true at the same time. We don't need to be fighting over deficit versus difference. Abby has passions and talents as well as struggles. When I hear things like different, not less, I don't think people are trying to say autistic people should have no supports whatsoever because we're just a different type of person and a different personality. Although that kind of is true as well, but I think different, not less is about respect for me. It is about human rights. Yes, not every person who is born will fit into this world perfectly. Not every person will be able to make a load of money, but autistic people all over the spectrum should not be seen as any less valuable or any less human or any less autistic for that matter. If you didn't catch the video where I reacted to Abby's mom on Jubilee and spoke about some other issues that autistic people have with autism moms, including Autism Speaks, I touched on that a little bit, then you can check out that video, I'll link it up top and I'll link it in the description as well. And if you want something light and fun and you want to feel part of the autistic community again not like you're being alienated i understand i have a playlist of all the videos i've done just reacting to actually autistic memes memes made by autistic people and those are quite fun so you might want to watch that one if you would like these videos to keep coming you can support me over on patreon the lowest here is four us dollars a month the thing that most people are most excited about when they sign up i think is joining the discord server where you can chat to other autistic people and people who are otherwise neurodivergent and people who are considering whether or not they could be autistic. There's no gatekeeping happening there, you know? There's no, are you neurodeficit? Are you neurodifferent? You're just, you're welcome there. Everybody is welcome. My neurotypical husband is in there a lot and has a lot of fun too. So it's, it's a lovely space. And then I also post two exclusive videos there every month and then a bunch of other stuff for the higher tiers as well. But there's loads of hours and hours of stuff on there. At some point I need to count up how many hours we have going on there as well. And there's gonna be a load more stuff coming this month. And I think I've said everything I need to say. I've been on a long tangent, so now I can't remember. Yes, I have. So I'll see you in my next video over, over, over on Sunday, I was gonna say. That sounds weird. On Sunday. Okay, I need to stop talking. This is why I have an ADHD diagnosis. Bye!